think it's slowing down here. So um, there's a lot of content that I can give about the JVM, and I don't know who see. Has anyone seen this talk before, or should I actually do the whole talk? You've seen it before. Is that it? Does anyone care? Should I should I skip to why JNI is slow, or should I go do this whole talk? Skip skip till I go to why it's slow. Fine. Okay, so I'm going to blow through stuff, including. Uh, uh, including all kinds of crazy things that people have done. Okay, so here's why JNI is slow. So, um, so ideally you could have JNI calls be like a simple call. And that works for things where the application set is fixed that you know ahead of time that the code that you're calling is well behaved. And the thing that Hotspot did was say, I don't know that the code I'm calling is well behaved, it might be bad in lots of evil ways. And so I have to defend against the unknown badness of native code. So the, the, there's a bunch of different defense things you do. Uh, the first one I'm going to mention here is, um, well, we'll, take a look at this. This is just a call. I'm going to pretend the native call is pass a double uh, and return an object. And so in the land of Spark, and I picked Spark because it's kind of ugly assembly code, but if I do this on x86, it's a little bit different, but it's just as ugly. So Spark, you're going to do a register window push, and you're going to have to shuffle the args because the incoming arg has to go to the outgoing register, fine. You make the call, and you return the result back to, you know, reverse it, and return, you're done. So x86 have roughly equivalent code. It's push BP and pop BP and add to BP to make a stack frame and shuffle an argument register once and do the same exa exact thing. And this is what you'd like a native call to look like, but it doesn't get to do that. So the calling conventions vary, and that's because the native code is often C code, and C code lives in the land of var args. In the land of var args, doubles and ints and pointers and floats all get run into the same pile of registers because printf just knows them by the count of, register, uh, count of registerizable items. So you can't pass doubles in the double registers, in the floating point registers, which you can on Spark, and you can on an x86. It has you know, SSE registers. They're all there. So you still end up moving the doubles from the double registers because you want to pass them that way for a Spark call or an x86 Java call, sorry, a typed language call, into C code. So you do register shuffle. In the case of Spark, I have to do a misaligned register shuffle, and therefore I have to do an evil stored to memory loaded as two words. It's kind of a dorky ass thing. Um, x86 has something morally equivalent, although not the exact bug here, but you end up shuffling some registers around. So the next thing is that as soon as I call a native code, the, the VM, the runtime system, doesn't know how long that call is going to be there. And perhaps it's there for a long time. Perhaps it blocks on I.O. and wakes up a millennium later. Meanwhile, other threads run. They allocate. I have to do a GC cycle. So I have to do a GC cycle. I have to crawl the stack and find all the pointers. So if I handed pointers off to native code, I can't do a GC cycle because the native Kai will have his pointers move out from under him. Or he'll pass pointers around internally and he's not talking politely to the runtime system. He doesn't have an oop map. So I don't know where those pointers are and so I don't actually get to change them in the native code. So if I actually move this object, the native code will break because his pointer goes stale. So I don't hand native pointer, I don't have GC well pointers to native code, I do a handleizing thing. I hand him a pointer to a pointer. And then I go update the contents of the handle behind his back. That works. But I can't actually hand him a bare g garbage collectible pointer. So I have to do this handleizing game where uh, I take an item and I throw it on the stack. That's that store W there. And I put the address of the stack location, the add stack pointer 72, in the register. That's the handle I pass. That slot on the stack, that stack pointer plus 72, that's where the pointer actually lives. That's where GC will find it and update it. I build a new map that indicates that that's where a pointer is. And then I have to do a null check because null handles a null pointer. It's, it's the definition of how the handles work. Reverse that and unwind because I'm returning a oop. I have to unwind a handle on the way back out. So I get a little handling game going on here. Maybe I'm locking because it's a synchronized native. And so I have to do all the crap for locking. Um, and in the case of, you know, hotspot with uh, thin lock headers, you load the header word, you fiddle with some bits, you do a CAS instruction. Assuming it wins, you got the lock and you're done. I don't show any of the slow path cases here, and you have to unlock on the way out, so there's perhaps a locking game going on. Um, the next thing is that I might end up doing this GC, which I mentioned before. To do a GC, you have to do a stack crawl. To do a stack crawl, I have to ask somebody, where is the stack pointer? And so the slides I mentioned before that I blew through, one of them says, uh, very surprising to me, but on every OS I've ever looked at, if you ask for the stack pointer of a remote thread, 
on very low frequency, it will hand you complete crap. So 99% of the time, you'll get a good stack pointer, and 0.001, whatever the number is, it's low frequency, it hands you something that is garbage. And my thesis is that it's because somewhere in the call into the native code, you did a, a bad TLB miss, which turned into a bad page fault, which turned into a stack overflow handler, turned, turned I don't know what the hell, something, something, something went on. And the OS, while he'll unwind that correctly, if, when he's returning from that call, if you go ask this core for that core stack pointer at the time that it disappeared in native code, you get like junk back. So you can't rely on it. So what I do in, what I did for Azul and what I was doing something similar at Spark, at, at uh, Sun, Hotspot, was I store the stack pointer down as an indicator of you know, where the, the stack crawl begins. It serves a second purpose, which is to say it unlocks the stack for GC. So what does that mean? So while the stack's in motion by a, by a Java thread doing work, you can imagine the stack's like a blur. It's up and down, up and down, up and down. The guy's like furiously working on his stack. There's no way GC can get in there and do anything. So he dives into native code. At this point down, it's a blur in the native code doing whatever the hell it's doing. But from this point up, it's static. And I want to do garbage collection on it and find those pointers. So where are those pointers? So the way I find them is I go ask for the stack pointer to see where I start my crawl. And our program counter, which refers directly to this code, and the program counter is a magic key and a hash table lookup for the stack map for this code. And I find the pointers here, and then I say, how big is my stack frame? And I go up a frame, and I can go ask again, what are the pointers in this frame, and this frame, and I do a crawl up, and it's all good. So I need a couple items, but I also have this concept that the stack is unlocked and available for GC, or it's locked by the running thread, and I cannot GC it. So the stacks come in these three flavors. There is locked by the running thread doing its normal thing. It is unlocked at this point and up or it's locked by GC, who's scribbling in that stack frame furiously, and you cannot execute it with your regular thread because he'll pick up a half crap pointers, some, some flip from one place to another, and others not, right? So the stack, you have a, the notion is the stack has three states, locked by self, locked by GC, or unlocked, and I have to unlock it. So that last store down there, that is an unlocking store. On that clock cycle and thereafter, it could be the state that the GC has acquired the stack lock and is fiddling with those bits. All right, so on the clock cycle, that's the thing that, that you, there's no delay here. You think it's very low frequency that I would have it such a narrow race in time, but it definitely happens, and you will crash and burn if you don't do this in the right order. So those stores are in the correct order as well. You cannot change that order around, and you rely on x86 strong ordering, and on Spark you get strong ordering, and on Azul systems you had loose ordering, so you had to put a, a right barrier there, or it was incorrect. Okay, same thing in reverse. I come out, I'm running, now I want to run on my standard Java gc -able stack, but the GC's busy scribbling on it, I have to acquire a stack lock. So the unlock was a bare store, but the acquire requires a CAS instruction. So there's a CAS there. Take the address of the stack location where I, where I put the stack pointer, and I want to CAS down a zero, saying I own my own stack, and I'm gonna be able to use it, and if I fail that CAS, it's because GC's in progress and I have to go stop and install that thread because that my stack is being scribbled on by GC right now. And then I handed handles out. So the native code gets some handles and he likes to make more handles. So as a convenience, I go give him some freebie stack based handles and then I reset that stack of handles. But if he uses those handles, the GC knows where to find them and update those pointers. So I hand him the address of a spare area for him to go fiddle with uh, make some more handles, and then I reset it when I'm done. Um, the standard J and I calling convention asks for another argument, which is basically some thread local storage area for the J and I environment bits that gets passed in. So there's a couple extra sort of junk words thrown in. Um, we do do some profiling tags where you say, hey, I made a call to, and you can name the call in the tag. And the tag is something like, I just called kernels, you know, dot IO write call, or a read call, or something like that. I'm, I'm looking for getting some feedback about kernel I.O. calls I'm making here, native calls I'm making. So the call looks like this, all thrown together. You know, up at the top, there's a standard, of, hey, I made a stack frame, and then immediately I threw down this junk word for JNIM. Then I had to handleize uh, uh, every oop that I was carrying along, and so I showed one, but maybe I've got five or 10 or none, I don't know. 
Um, and they had an argument shuffle because the doubles were in the wrong register for the calling conventions, the two different calling conventions enacted here. Um, then I had to lock my stack so I could allow a G, uh, unlock my stack to allow a GC to happen. At the same time, I threw down the, the pointer to tell the GC where this code is. Um, and then I made the native call. And then I unlocked in reverse and I dehandleized any results and I popped my stack and I walked out. And this pile of instructions, which varies by signature, if you look at it, it's somewhere between, you know, 20 to 100 instructions, 20 to 100 clock cycles to make a native call. So if your native call is something stupidly cheap, this is your overhead. <laughs> Independent of whether or not you fail any of the locks. I didn't show locking in here. Uh, and and I, I assume you didn't fail the GC lock. If you fail the GC lock, you're stuck on GC pause, right, as, as a cost of a native call too. Yeah. So you asked the question, are there faster JNI calls? This is the fastest JNI call possible under the assumptions I made. The assumption is the native code is bad. He will do things with pointers, like hide them away and use them again later, that will break when a GC moves a pointer. So if you want to have a moving collector, you have to handleize, or you have to trust that the native call is being good. So you can trust the native calls being good if you own the whole application stack and you wrote that native code. And there was a rule that said, thou shalt not do things with pointers. And if you break that rule, you crash and burn, it's your fault, it's your bug, right? But on the other hand, if I'm producing a tool for a broad audience, I can't make that assumption. So instead, I don't hand out, oops. Originally, Hotspot did hand out bare pointers used in graphics, used in all kinds of IO layers and that just kept breaking and we kept changing collectors and different collectors had different rules on how you could do things with pointers and the native code would always just break and break and break and then people would swear, no, I'm not holding on to a pointer, but they did anyhow and they didn't know it and then much, much later they would crash and burn when the pointer got moved. So Hotspot went through this transition somewhere like 15 years ago where, maybe 20 years ago, where they demanded the JNI call overhead and in response the system got a lot more stable. Can we do anything better about uh, native uh, functions that uh, do not accept any objects or do not return any, any objects, that uh, never call any JNI functions, never raise any exceptions? Uh, basically, it's just an external system that just works and can never do anything that affects the JVM except maybe sec faulting and bringing the process down. Right, so, so the, that's, a, that's a question is, is there a way that I can tell the, the JVM that this is a this is a call that, trust me, it doesn't do anything bad. And, and right now, there isn't any hook for that. I mean, it wouldn't be hard to add, you just not do this work and actually just cough up a regular call. So one of the, the Grawl thesis is that um, if your code is simple enough to do what you said, and in fact, fire a bit more complicated, you could actually inline it because if you can understand the native C code, you could just run the JIT altogether. And then you extend the boundary where the code is managed to include your native code. And then there's obvious giant performance gains to be had by, by crossing that boundary, uh, uh, moving you inside the managed code boundary, basically, and then uh, allowing you to jit through it and do that kind of stuff. Um, I, you know, it's possible, and, and I don't know how far it'll go. Um, my guess is that people will immediately abuse such an API and things will crash and burn, and you'll get a reputation for being a bad code smell if you use that API. Like the count of times you actually need it is pretty, got to be pretty limited. That you need to go in and out of, the, like if you make the J and I boundary a billion times a second, maybe there's another way to do what you want to do. But if you make it a billion times a second, this overhead, this overhead's expensive, it's high. But really, do you need to cross that J and I boundary a billion times a second? If you cross it a million times a second, it's probably still pretty high. If you cross it 10,000 times a second, you won't care. This is just too cheap. Right, so, so, so there is some, something that says I have this funny zone where I'm crossing it, the boundary a lot, but I can't write that code in Java. It has to do something that's not, you know, it's, it's like doing something to OS, it's doing a graphics call. So there might be something with games that care to make that boundary call a lot to do graphics things. I don't know. So I'm looking for a use case that would justify it, and you have to justify it to, you know, Larry Ellison, not to me. Uh. There's actually one such case in the hotspot VM right now. It's called uh, critical natives. Critical natives, yeah. It's special support for uh, area arguments. Uh, so instead of getting a, uh, 
entire uh, argument in the native function, you get uh, just an int pointer and the length parameter. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I'm having trouble with your uh, Sorry. Uh, so uh, when you use a cr critical native uh, JNI function. What's, what's the function? It's called uh, criti critical native. There, there's a bunch of function so uh, for JNI again that called critical natives. If you calling uh, a function that there is only primitives, critical natives. Native. Sorry. <laughs> and so if you, you, you are calling a, a, a function with only primitives or not synchronized or everything, there is much, uh, much uh, less overhead. Okay, so so critical native came in after I I was there. I don't know what the what they do for the call. It sounds like the intent was to do exactly what I'm talking about here, which is skip all this stuff and just make a bare call. And again, the rules are: if you cheat on pointers, you lose. If you block, you lose because no one else can do a GC cycle. So, so there there are some you know you can look at this overhead and ask can I get rid of some of it? Uh, you get rid of the handleizing and argument shuffles if you don't pass any args. Without doing anything, nothing, nothing with critical native. You just don't pass any args. You don't have the the, the argument shuffle overhead. Um, but you still have to do a stack crawl. And so maybe you want to fool around with the stack crawl, or you have to promise that your function comes back in a timely fashion, because time to safe point will be the sum of your function plus all other overheads. So somebody else had a call, a discussion like, "What's this? Is the call from Java to native? There's the reverse." from native into Java. It has actually substantially more overhead at the time I left the JVM. Because that path didn't happen very often, it was never optimized. So that path was, you, you called into the VM code, the C code. C code did exactly what was going on here in the, in the unwind direction. You know, invert this loop, the, the, this path in out, just invert it. But it did it using C code, basically reflectively doing the, like the interpreted version so not the jitted version. He asked all the questions in C code one after another after another and, and eventually decided, here's how I'm doing argument setup, here's how I'm doing whatever, oh, I have to do the GC lock, but I'm doing it in C code instead of a handful of assembly language instructions and that kind of thing. So it was much more expensive to go that direction. It could be optimized the same way by making these wrappers to do a, a, a cheap version in and out. As far as I know, that work's not been done. Um, so if you if you were to go back 20 years ago and back to Azul early days designing hardware, what would you add to hardware to 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 do better? Maybe you would want to uh, to add you know 65th bit uh, to uh, identify you know showing that uh, this address this memory address holds a value or an address or essentially a loop that needs to be updated. What would you do uh, to help? Uh, Native calls to help, to help other subsystems of JVM in hardware um, to 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 eliminate some of these issues. You're asking what what I do in in, in hardware. Hard in hardware. So if you were designing hardware from scratch, because right now we're running on conventional x86. You know, for yeah. example, you know, like I say, if a register, it does not know if it's if it's a it's integer value or or right. loop. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, reason yeah. we need to have yeah, loop yeah. maps and. Okay, so so. So I, I'm going to up-level a little bit and say, what would I do to help the Oracle JVM? So I did a lot of work at Azul, and a lot of it had nothing to do with hardware. There was a lot of stupid things going on in how you start and stop threads, and I would totally take the threading model that I hacked through at Azul and hack it through the, Azul, the, the Oracle JVM, and that would give you uh, ragged safe points and would give you the ability to stop and start individual threads, and that in turn makes it cheap to do a bunch of things. So bias locking becomes vastly cheaper to unlock or lock. Uh, stack crawls become self-service tasks that are incredibly cheap and don't contribute to safe point to pause times. So th th and there's a bunch of related activities. Um, I don't know, as well we found like 20 or 30 fun things you would do once you had the ability to start and stop individual threads that all made the VM much lower pause time and much more efficient uh, across a broad spectrum. So, so there's things to do to Oracle. Now, if I was to do, do hardware, there are some things that hardware, there's all hardware did really well, and some things that we skipped over because we didn't know what to do with it. And you're asking, in particular, could I do anything here? I would say starting out, the hardware was, you know, like a spark, fat risk with lots of registers, and the JIT makes good use of them. You know, I don't know, 64 registers on Itanium, maybe it doesn't make so much use. 32 registers, it does. 16 is tight. 
right? You, you definitely could do between 16 and 32. So more registers is good. Um, the, the common operations that cause clock cycles, you, we put in hardware support for, and I would ask that out of a modern x86. So read barrier, um, the, the shift scale add for arrays, the x86 does it the wrong way, and you always have an extra sign extend thrown in the array math, that's stupid, that you'd rather not have, that you don't need it if you had a shift scale add that did the right order of, of, of zero extend, then shift, then add. Um, and uh, uh, th there's a couple of other bit fiddly ones that add up 5% here, 5% there across the board that were useful. Transactional memory? So the transactional memory didn't work out for Azul. It was, it was there, but the use case that we thesis was we'll go make locks locking code run fast by transacting through it, having more parallelism. And the answer was there wasn't really, the code involved wasn't really transactional friendly no matter what you did. It had some sequential behavior buried in it. Um, so you look at hash table, the canonical poster child is I have a hash table, the old school one that was synchronized, and I wanted to go parallel to go faster. And the, you know, assuming it was a bottleneck, could I get more parallelism by, by doing transactions? And most of these were used in large, large caches, and the large caches was mostly read-only. So very few people were actually locking to mutate. They were locking to guard against the mutator, which was rare. So it was commonly that you would just do a read and win and get out. So obviously this is a great poster child for doing transactional memory. You transactionally take the lock, you do the read, it all hit. You unlock, you're done. No one had done a modification under the hood behind your back, so you didn't care, and now all the readers in the world parallel run through the cache. So this is the obvious thing. Okay, hash table has a mod counter in it. The mod counter adds a plus one every time you touch the damn table, and then that becomes single-threaded right there, loses your transactional behavior, and it's a useless counter. No one cares for this damn thing. So to fix this problem, we'd have to have changes in the JDK on legacy code, and totally the goal here was to make legacy code run faster. And we'd have to have some sort of profiling ability that told you why a transaction was not possible. And then you'd have to programmers to use your tool to look at their code and figure out why it was not transacting successfully to in order to mutate it into a world that would work with transactional memory. So in that sense, the transactional memory like failed. It didn't solve a problem it was intended to solve. And there might be yet more uses for transactional memory in, you know, there's small amounts now available in x86 and there's probably useful places to go do things where you do multi, multi word updates on tight common data structures that you otherwise would have to do something more clever with how to do you know, concurrent updates. Along the way between then and now, I became really quite expert at doing concurrent algorithms and how to figure out uh, how to do the right one word atomic update that did a large state transition of you know, atomically over a set of things. So, so it is possible to do that and, and Having done it in software, you know, Intel's sort of cases, like, why the hell are we doing it in hardware? These things are not common enough and used or written by enough programmers to make it important to solve it in hardware to be convenient and fast. You need to figure out how to do transactional memory yourself, basically, or concurrent algorithms yourself. So, so as far as I know, both a Hotspot and, and, and Azul now support transactional memory, but I cannot recall any numbers, you know, what, what which workload, workloads and under which circumstances now perform faster. Um, so, um, but Gil has a talk about it. Um, it's recorded somewhere, but I can't remember the, the, the stats. We, we fiddled with it and fiddled with it and fiddled with it, and the answer was you always hit some other bottleneck and you never got the parallelism out, right? And so even if we hand-rolled these various things, you'd hit some other bottleneck. There's a separate question of what to do about uh, uh, pointers and GC. So one of the great, you know, fun things in Hotspot was the decision, in which I blew through those slides, so now I'm, I, I could go back through them if people want to see what the hell is going on. But, but what to do about, so I saw somebody said yes, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it here, except my guys can fall asleep here. We'll go back. So what to do about um, safe points. So, so assuming you're into having a parallel concurrent incremental collector uh, and then it's moving as well. There's, there's good reasons for all of these things, but it's also really hard. Y you still end up with the question of where do I find my pointers to do something with them? And then there are a couple different choices that people have looked at over the years. Uh, you know, back in the day when I was doing Hotspot, this was a raging debate. And one of them was stop anywhere, and the other one was safe points. And we went with safe points, and it worked out fine in practice. Stop anywhere is an alternative that wasn't chosen. 
and that one was somehow i can find oops at every program counter i can stop my program anywhere and i can still find the pointers and how do i do that if i have a map at every instruction it's just too much the maps are too vast and i blow out memory and it takes forever to do something with it so maybe I have maps rarely, and I interpret between them, and then that's very hard on an x86 to interpret instructions in order to track pointers through them. Um, one of the ones that I was thinking about for Azul was to fix which registers hold pointers and which do not. So for instance, you could have even odds. The, the even registers hold pointers, and the even stack slots hold pointers, and the odds do not. And then you don't have to have an oop map. You just stop anywhere, and it's even in odds, and you just walk the stack that way. And you have some drag time on some loose pointers registers that were like hanging around the stack that are dead that you didn't bother to null out. Um, but otherwise, you drop the whole complexity of engineering of tracking oop maps and save points. Um, the conservative on stack versus exact on heap is the one that says, in a 64-bit pointer land, it's pretty easy to range the pointer space such that it doesn't look like integers that commonly show up. So the number of times I have to get conservative is very rare. And then I just choose to not move any objects that are pointed to by stack references. And anything that they point to is on the heap and I can move. So some values are now pinned. And most can be moved. And I can get rid of my fragmentation issues most of the time, mostly. And that has the issue that I have to allow some objects to be pinned. And that doesn't fit well with a lot of GC algorithms. So because we went down that path, there's JNI's got you know pinning things in it. And the answer was a whole lot of collectors paid a whole lot of grief to allow any pinning at all. Either the collector didn't move, or if it moved, it wanted to move every goddamn thing and not have any exceptions to it. So, so pinning was a painful operation. And the conservative stack says, I'm going to have a collector that allows pinning of the stack guys. But on the other hand, I don't have any maps on the stack. And that's where most of the cost goes, because those are the ones that you have to cooperate with the JIT to track pointers and stuff. So, so there are some, you know, some games to be played there that might make sense. What Hotspot did for safe points, uh, collu uh, uh, colluded together the GC points and the deoptimization, which you still need for other reasons. You still need the deop points. So as soon as you needed the deop points, it was actually pretty cheap to throw in oop maps. Um, and then, for the same reason that you needed the safe point at all was for class loading issues. You had to have them periodically. You had to guarantee there were no long paths to a safe point because that was your GC pause time. It was also your class loading time for somebody who's loading a thread. Uh, some other thread is doing a class load would have to wait until this guy got stopped so you could confirm his jitted code didn't have any of these things. Um, you, you put all that engineering in anyhow to, for safe points. Said they were here, they happened so, every so often, they weren't too often. They tracked the state of the jitted code so I could unwind to an interpreted state, which meant they tracked pointers also just because they were tracking everything else. Um, it was way, it worked out really well. So it was efficient too. So, so safe points are efficiently able to unwind the state. The cost of maintaining a safe point is actually fairly low. You typically take the things that are going to be dead after the JIT's done with it, but are live in the architected state, and you spill them off to the stack after computing them once. There's a few of the things you end up carrying along that you might, you know, like index counters and for loops, you might reverse engineer out of some other state that the JIT did something different with. But it, overall, the safe point thing worked out really well. It allowed it high, high levels of optimization uh, while still allowing you to unwind back to the interpreted state directly. And then it covered the GC issue. So I'm going to throw this one out as like, like, like a war story that, that's kind of humorous in hindsight. Um, in the land of, you know, x86 32-bit, where Hotspot began, point, uh, longs were a pair of registers. And you had you add, add with carry. And that was, uh, you know, I, I did the classic uh, register allocator with register pair thing. Um, I'm sorry, I did the classic register allocation where I did add, add with carry as a separate instruction. So add with carry is a little odd guy because you had to carry the flags through and you couldn't overlap multiple add, add carries because you'd crush the flags register. But it was two 32-bit values. It turns out that for the longest time, the major users of long math were the crypto routines for web services, which is big integer package, which is doing longs really as a pair of ints with a carry between them. So there's a lot of masking of high and low halves of longs are shifting by 32 left to right. And so a whole lot of that stuff, when you express it as a 32-bit value, just works out directly. So if I load a 64-bit long and then I mask, the, X8, the, the hotspot JIT would just say, oh, load a 32-bit value and zero extend on the load as a single instruction. 
So it worked out really slick. Same thing for, oh, I need to store the high half here and the low half there, that I would store the low half as a store 32, and I'd shift if I needed to, it was another register, I'd just store the other register somewhere else. So, so it, was, it was highly efficient code. Then along came Spark with 64-bit LAN, and everyone yelled and screamed, you can't do add, add with carry, which is fully supported on Spark. You had to do the 64-bit math. So we dropped the add, add with carry support, because it was complicated and hard to do the carry thing, and just went with 64-bit math. But on the 32-bit x86, you had to do register pairs mimicking a 64-bit register. Well, if you got seven registers, you get three pairs. So suddenly, the count of actual registers like fell in half that you could use on a 32-bit x86. And, and the code just sucked. It was like way the hell slower than the old add, add with carry code. So, so the, the funny story was that we ended up unwinding that and going back to add, add with carry on the 32-bit x86. And I think these days, we, we're back to, it's only 64-bit because it, it, all the x86s are 64-bit. There's definitely an era where add, add with carry was way the hell more efficient than 64-bit math on the x86. So it was just like, like who, who would have thunk that coming? I never, never saw that one coming. So should I go back to these slides? Things that works well. How's it things that works well? Because this is like, what the hell? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. If you're up to date with the Project Panama thing, but one of their aims is to do faster native calls, right? So do you know what they do different? Or what they try to do different? No, I don't know. It's probably something I should go find out because you're the third person to ask me. <laughs> Okay, so here's things that work well. So safe points and uh, uh, pulling for safe points. So the, the basically safe points um, are these, I mentioned before, you stop a thread at a convenient spot where you have this map of what's going on in the world and you still get good optimization, but you can do a lot of self-service tasks. In particular, you can crawl your own stack. It's hot in your own cache. You can crawl it really fast. So a self-thread of you know, is y yourself, if you're told, do something at a safe point, and you're, you're to do something is walk your stack and collect your roots, that's over with in microseconds. So it's like really cheap. Um, I thought polling would be expensive. Um, it turns out that polling was actually not so expensive, even on thread by individual thread basis. So if a thread needs to ask the question, should I stop at a safe point? How does he do that? So I got it down to uh, take your stack pointer and shift and mask it, which is getting you to thread local storage, load a bit and test and branch. And x86 will uh, 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 start that load, but predict on the branch correctly, because you rarely stop at a, any individual save point, and, and speculate through the branch the correct way, and it's under a clock cycle. It's some fraction of a clock, because you're getting other ops in the shadow of the load and the branch. So call it a clock cycle, but the save point pull is like really, really cheap. So pull for save points is great. And that means that when you want to stop a thread, you get essentially cooperative preemption. So the thread will stop shortly enough whenever told to go stop. And now you can install like exception objects on it if one guy's throwing a thread.death on another thre stack. Or you can crawl for GC or change his own roots or flag to the GC that he's passed some GC safe point or whatever it's going to be. Um, obviously, the heavyweight JIT compiler has had a lot of mileage here. Um, that worked out really well as well. So what, so what you described actually is zinc safe pointing while the hotspot does pulling on a protective page. So they don't, they don't rely on branch predictions. They, they, they're a little easier on branch predictor in x86. Okay, try again. Yeah, fine. So um, I did a lot of stuff in C2 that was roundly considered not acceptable, not possible. You can't make this happen efficiently. That, you know, I, I basically proved people wrong. Um, it, you know, the graph-based IR, um, it, it, it's, I will claim, at least for me and for most of the people who've used C2 for any length of time, that it's actually very easy to understand and very easy to do basic extensions on. That the, the notion of a graph 
rewriting rule to do optimization has some clean theoretical ways to go to operate. From there, it got complicated. That I, I'm looking at people who are like looking at me funny. That was nothing to do with the IR. That was doing a lot of people doing funny stuff to the compiler that I never find. Uh, okay, graph calling allocator. So, so this one's actually key to performance. I think the Grawl guys have got this figured out because I've, I've pounded this before. Um, a lot of the JITs and compilers I was looking at at the, that era had the issue with inlining where if you inlined too much, your method got too big, had too many live values, the register allocator would start to spill. One good spill would deserve another, and it would spill and spill and spill and spill and spill, and you lost all the benefit of inlining. You just like spilled to death. But if you don't make that inlining, you end up with a uh, 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 call prolog epilog code, which is essentially structured spilling, where you're saving registers in and around the call site, which are exactly like stores and loads to the stack. It's spill code in a different way. So the goal of a C2 register allocator was to not be worse when you were spilling than if you hadn't inlined and you were going to do call prolog epilog stuff anyhow. And we basically achieved that, and that made the compiler robust in the face of over inlining. And then at that point, we could do a lot more free with the inlining heuristics, which in turn gave a lot of performance. Um, yesterday, you mentioned that you know about Graal. Graal also have intermediate representation graph. What is different between C2 and Graal? I don't know. I, I assume that they're very similar. It's very clearly that th they were inspired by C2, but I don't know what you guys have done differently. I, I gave a talk um, years and years ago to old school compiler hackheads about the difference between a graph IR and a traditional tuple-based IR, and that discussion boils to the very essence of what it means to have program semantics in a data structure. And it might be useful for the Graal team to hear that, to understand the design constraints under which C2 was built, and see that you're doing something similar. Because I really boiled it away down to the very essence of program semantics as a data structure. And then from there, you want to add and add and add and add whatever features and utility that you like. But first, get it to where you know the core IR has nothing except the basic program semantics. And then extend. Because if you do otherwise, you end up with a whole crap load of weird state you end up maintaining and screwing with as you roll through things that not necessary. It makes your life much more complicated. Portable stack manipulation. Um, so I, I ported, you know, Hotspot to Spark, obviously, and x86, obviously, and Itanium, and Azul, and uh, maybe a, uh, ARM chips, and maybe another one, like too many. So along the way, every freaking OS and chip needed some kind of notion of how to crawl a stack, and I never thought you could have made that portable, but it worked out, and it worked out really well. So portable stack crawling code, the notion of the first frame, the next frame, and there is there, no, is there another frame as an iterator? And then internally that iterator bumps a stack pointer, bumps a program counter, fetches the program counter from someplace. There's a register window involved. It forced a spill to the stack to flush it and to reload it later or whatever it's going to do. But that, that hardware specific thing got hidden away by an iterator. And then the code in the VM that's trying to do some reflective thing on the stack didn't need to know whether it had an Itanium style window or a Spark style window or an x86 no window at all. Do you use uh, 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 call or save, call or save registers and where are they or not? So, so all that disappeared under the hood of the portable stack crawler and made life a hell of a lot easier to do a reflective VM. It's perhaps a lesson for, for people doing a new VM from scratch right now. Uh, and then frame adapters, which were it, same as that JNI code you saw, it's an argument shuffle, but between the JIT and the interpreter. So if you decide you have an interpreter all, you immediately have a problem that you have a funny calling convention where there's a stack in the middle of a method that's going up and down, and you have to lay out things on that stack. Um, when you're, that stack wants to call to hot native code, he has to shuffle things from a stack into registers. And when you unwind, you have to take your return result and move it back where the interpreter expects it. So that shuffle, uh, as a custom bit of assembly is like once you figure it out, it's actually pretty easy to do and really, really cheap. And it makes it cheap to call between interpreter and compiled code, which again makes it not so important where that line between interpreted and compiled code is. 
If that boundary shift is very expensive, you better goddamn get it right, which means you end up jitting a lot of code that is actually pretty low frequency because you can't afford to cross that boundary very often. Hotspot can cross it in a couple clock cycles. Code cache. Jam all your code in four gigs, because you don't, that's enough. And you get a 32-bit program counter, which all the hardware supports directly as a 32-bit set of instructions doing 32-bit program counters. And the whole 64-bit program counter thing always turned into like a giant pile of extra instructions on all the different hardware I've ever looked at, including x86. Um, use a cheap local call, that's what it amounts to. The blah, 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 a lot debugging flags. So somebody had to talk about how do you debug and test OS-like things like a JVM. Um, yes, how do you debug this large complicated thing that's multi-threaded, it's multi-this, it's multi-that. It's basically it's an OS at user land. Um, we added these flags which took rare cases and made them common. So what do I, why do I have rare cases and why do I make them common? Okay, so the common thing you make cheap and efficient. But usually along the way of making it cheap and efficient, there's some bailout cases that are really hard to handle. The obvious one is allocation. I make my allocation bump pointer add. It's really cheap and efficient. But if the allocation fails, if that bump pointer fails, I have to do a GC cycle. That's really expensive and really rare relative to allocation. So the transition from I'm running normally to I'm stopping to do a GC is a fairly rare transition. It happens every few seconds compared to the billions of instructions that are running a second and the millions of allocations that are happening a second. So it's very, very much more rare. Same thing with um, stopping at any individual safe point. Any individual safe point is very rare to be stopped at. So if I have a bug where I occasionally put out incorrect debugging information, incorrect oop maps or architected state information, if I don't stop at that safe point very often, I'll never crash there. I'll never find that bug. So there's a lot of those things where you have these slow paths that are rare and these fast paths that are common. The fast paths get the bugs beaten out of them because you hit them all the time. The slow paths don't. So to get to be robustness, you have to make the rare path common. And that's what these blah, 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 lot flags did. They said, take this rare path and do it all the time. And it runs hugely slower, but you go to the QA people and say, okay, turn this flag on. It's going to be 100 times slower to run. Run overnight. Do some big gas thing. Now you catch all these rare bugs, like, deterministically, easily, cheaply up front. It, it's a, it was a huge win. On a code notion, um, on, on, uh, speaking of code, code cache, um, in, in JDK9, there's a nice optimization as work being done towards reshuffling uh, code blobs so that the ones that are that are that are kind of called together they, they, they call one, one another allocated closely this decreases still be uh, misses and, um, and and therefore it's more efficient so it's not just you know, the four gig space but in also the order in which the code blobs are located and how the space is being freed up when classes are loaded and corresponding code blobs are no longer, no longer needed. Um, so that heuristical optimization um, it's, is, is, is proven to be pre pretty helpful. It's coming in, in, in GDK9. So big parts of this talk that I haven't got to, and I probably won't, are what is the life of code and how do you get rid of it? How do you get rid of dead code? And the answer is it's hard to get rid of dead code. It's hard to get. It's hard to know that it's dead, and and it's hard to get rid of it when it is dead, um, and that goes hand in hand with where is the code laid out, and and who can touch it, and who can see it, and can I shuffle it, and things like that. So it's a separate little war story from eons ago. I was doing some performance debugging on some stupid specint app on you know not not Java at all, and was having performance issues compared to my neighbor, where one of us was always faster or slower. And the answer was, if you did link of start at o. The, the shell command line sorted those words alphabetically and the .o files came out in alphabetical order. And that gave you one kind of iCache layout, which is worth one kind of performance. And if you use the make file, he had a link line that named things as you know, make variables, and that was not in alphabetical order, that was in sort of programmer, I put this together order, and that order had a different performance impact. And we finally tracked that down to where in one iCache layout, some lines in the iCache were cold and some were hot. So if you have 10% cold lines in the iCache, roughly your iCache is 10% smaller than it otherwise would be. When we shuffled things around, we did all kind of random shuffles for a while, you would suddenly get an iCache layout where it was sort of uniformly hot, and now you're using all of your iCache, more, and you got a 10% gain. You know, assuming an iCache misses count for one for one for performance, it was pretty close. Um, you got a 10% gain. It was a pretty tidy win. And that's strictly code layout landing well in your iCache.
shuffling together codes that are going to call each other. So they're sequential, means that they'll run through the iCache in order without uh, hitting the, the, you know, the eight-way associative lines and over committing some line and then suddenly that line's too hot and can't be used. It's going back and forth. Uh, you know, just, I just wanted to clarify that the example that you gave about the, the shell uh, laying alpha alpha alphabetically, that's about the statically compiled code and the code blobs there are about dynamically jitted, no, to generate, generated code. Yeah, I was talking about statically compiled code. The JIT thing has the same issue, whether the iCache yeah. layout happens as good or bad. And, and then you could look, there, you, it's clearly possible that you could look at the iCache usage pattern and look at where you did the jitted code and turn that into a, a shuffling game that produced a better iCache performance. That's something that, that it sounds like it's happening. Okay, back to things that... Do, do, you, th do you think that uh, there is a possibility to use uh, performance counters built into, into CPU, the, on the debugging uh, counters, and feed that into VM and use that uh, for at least for signaling that you know the current layout is not right and some extra else needs to be done. No. I, I'm assuming that's what's going on. I, I don't know what, what people are doing for this reshuffle game. Th there are two obvious things to do. One is just look at the counters on the code itself. Take your program counter, randomly sample your program counter and look at the code that's in and then associate heat with the program code and then try to sort things in heat order which will generally, generally sort of statistically lay you out in a way that you don't have two hot methods landing on the same iCache lines because they'll be adjacent in the code space so they won't have wrapped the iCache and come back around and co-located. What you don't want to have is all your hot code landing on the same mod 32k iCache space because then they'll compete for the same iCache lines. So that's that essentially a flattened call graph. Um, uh, flattened it's in sorted, in by, sorted by frequency of the code. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so the game I played long ago got a little more aggressive. We actually broke out hot methods from cold sections of code, hot code from cold code, profile the code, which totally the JVM is doing, and said this loop is hot, the rest of the method is cold, break it out as an outlining call, and then sort it with other hot people. And I don't care where the code codes land. I just want to make sure the hot code doesn't land on itself. All right, I'll, I'll just roll through till people pot, poke up a question. Um, obviously, thin locks worked out really well. Um, speculative locking uh, should be cheaper. I guess it's now turned on by default in JDK 8, maybe even, or 7. Somewhere along the line, bass locking got turned on by default. That was another good thing because too many locks are not contended. And actually, this is a direct symptom, but we don't know how to code a parallel uh, uh, concurrently. So the, the, the way you code concurrently now is you take your best guess as to how to write your concurrent code up, and then it breaks, so you throw some locks in. You keep throwing locks in until it works. And then you get a lot of junk locks that you didn't know why you had a low-frequency bug, but it happened. Yeah. Maybe we're heading, a, heading for a better realm. People you know, go to Erlang and to you know, actors and whatever. Here are some things that were hard to do, but were still worth doing. Um, making code portable force you to break out uh, code discipline break out implementation from concept. That was that, you know, that stack crawl, or portable stack crawling was one of those kinds of things. There were several of these things, whether you're a big Indian or a little Indian, whether your stacks went up or down. Um, th there were like four or five things that when you broke it out, you got the concept of what you're trying to accomplish separate from like the grotty low level details instead of blending them together. And that made it a lot easier to maintain and grow the code. Deopt. Um, Maybe it's too, okay, so fine. So, so deopt is no runtime cost to inline non-finals. This is not the classic solution done by all other VMs that I'm aware of, and no one else does it the way Hotspot does it. It's not rocket science, but it is very bit fiddly, and once you get it right, there's an interesting gain because you don't have a line in the code that says thou shalt not move above because if I went to override a non-final because new code loaded, I have to like, lock the code out from here down, and I don't have to do that in Hotspot. Uh, and so you get better code out by, by actually an interesting amount. But that infrastructure is in place, so Graal will just pick it right up and run with it. Uh, a lot of self-modifying code in the core runtime, and you need to be in a zone where it's easy and convenient, safe to write self-modifying code, and you'll get it right, and, and you, you'll, you can do maintenance on it and do updates and changes to it. So you have to think about writing machine code because there's a lot of that going on and you have to think about writing self-modifying code. So in particular, there's a lot of code patching games 
Uh, and the two main ones are the first one, which is uh, inline caches, and the second one is not an entrant code. So an inline cache is what Hotspot uses to make virtual calls cheap. And that's a one entry cache, the key value pair. It's a, it's a, it's a standard key value pair cache. The, the key is the method that you got in your hand that you're going to call, the, the class of the object you're going to call, sorry, and the value is the method you're going to call, and you encode them as a constant in the code that says, am I the right class? And the value is encoded in a call instruction that actually says, call this method. It's the hot code for this method. If you pass that test, then you jump to the correct code, and the test is almost always correct. And uh, 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 x86 will speculate through it anyhow, and it makes a virtual call that you couldn't inline down to like one clock cycle, uh, two clock cycles. Right, so it's really, really cheap way to make virtual calls that could go some ways weird, but in practice do not. Uh, same cost as a static call. And, um, but if you fail, you have to change that sequence to say, no, no, do the more expensive test, or go do the whole nine yard lookup thing. So you have to patch the code, and you have to patch it in the face of running Java threads. So one of the things you could do instead of patching the code is stop all the threads somewhere and then patch it mechanically with everyone stopped, but it's too much overhead, and it happens too often. So instead, you patch on the fly, which means you're patching code. Their x86 will see the instructions at any part of your patch. Like there's no coherency between the I and the D cache. So you have to be prepared to see half of a patch uh, and, and still do the right thing. Maybe the instructions span cache lines. You can't do atomic updates. There's a bunch of rules involved. You have to think through all the rules, and that means you end up wanting to have helpers to manage an inline cache. So I have functions in Hotspot that says, this is an inline cache. It's a pile of bits in memory, and I want to do things with it. I want to change the class I'm caching. I want to change the target method. I want to bail out from an inline cache to go the hard lookup. There, you know, there's a bunch of different things you do there, and in all those cases, you end up needing to have helpers to go touch the code because the rules involved in touching it are very delicate. They're very subtle and, and complicated. So you think about it. And, but when you do, it works, and you get to have this super fast thing. So hand in hand with that is a high level language assembler. So there's a lot of hand rolled assembly in Hotspot. Um, you want to have tight integration to the hand rolled assembly and VM invariants and runtime stuff. So it, it looks like you might want to use a standard like GNU assembler or whoever assembly you're going to use, but no, you have too many invariants. So you end up faking out the C code to look like you're writing assembly code, but it's actually C code that when executed emits the assembly into a buffer, but it also checks your invariants. It also can provide a bunch of other support, build OOP maps for you on the fly. It might have uh, uh, subtle code generation issues like an inline cache can't span uh, a cache line boundary because I need some section of it to be atomically updatable. So it might put some no ops in behind my back to allow that the branch op can be in one side, but the offset somewhere else. The call can be on this side of a, call, a cache boundary, but the four byte uh, target has to be all atomic. So he shuffles things a little bit behind my back to allow atomic updates. Things like that are going on. So, so I'm doing a lot of assembly, just bite the bullet, say I'm going to do a lot of assembly. And then how do I make my life convenient to do a lot of assembly? Okay, get, get your support going there. Um, eh, 64, this is getting to very Azul specific. I, I claim it should be done for Oracle as well. It's nothing to do with GC. This is everything to do with just cutting down object header sizes. Dense thread IDs is another thing I did at Azul that would go hand in hand for Oracle. Uh, damn it, put your stacks on two meg boundaries. And then you can simply mass to get your thread pointer. Mass your stack pointer to get your thread pointer. It means it's like a clock cycle to get your thread pointer. Uh, it turns out thread pointers are used like in a lot of places. And when they're used, they're typically used in very hot code. So, so it's crucial to be able to get thre current thread, thread colon dot current thread, it, it, like fast. And this is a way to get it in the clock cycle. Um, once you have that, you can do a whole lot of other stuff, including uh, stack under overflow using the TLB to mask the edges of the stack conveniently. Um, lots of fun things with protecting the whole stack for GC asserts. Thread IDs, which are the stack pointer shifted right by a few clocks, gives you a cheap small thread ID, which then you can put in object headers for locking and get some bits back in your object header. Um, common stuff like that. Uh, safe pointing single threads, I think I beat on already. Things I won't do again. Let's do that. So I, I probably wouldn't do C and C++ for a VM again, because I think I could do this in Java now. This is Maxine. This is, you know, Grawl, but you're just doing the compiler piece. But I would do the runtime as well. This is Maxine. Um, C2 did an old school Burr's pattern matching for instruction selection, which is based out of like Vax days, like 
never needed on a risk, not needed on x86 forever and a day. Like, what the hell is this in there for? It makes life a lot more complicated. A bunch of other things that C2 did for how to do portable code generation worked out really well, but I would claim this was not one of them. Hotspot originally came with patch and roll forward save points. Um, don't bother, go to the polling. Generic call save registers, too much of a mess. Don't need them on x86. I'm gonna skip that one. Constant oops in code, another one that didn't look obvious. It looks really good on 32-bit oops because the hardware, x86 hardware will do a 32-bit constant, um, but no other chip will do a 32-bit constant directly in code, and then you go to 64-bit constants and like, it doesn't work anymore. So just put them in a side table and load from the side table. Um, locked header object in the stack, oh my god. I, one of the things I did was, was I changed the locking layout completely and it was just a disaster to put locked object headers in the stack. Should not do that. Um, I, I can go into why it was done. I'm not going to, I'm gonna be out of time here, so I'll just be done. <laughs> done. <laughs>